Hello, how are you? Buenos, buenos dias. Any of you speak Spanish here? Buenos dias. Oh, good. Okay, then we're, we're doing very well. As, as you heard, my name is Maria Elena Salinas. I'm anchor for Univision Network News and uh, Aquí y Ahora. And I'm very, very excited. We came from Miami. My, I brought my daughter with me. Where is she? Gabriela? She's right there. Uh, junior in high school. Maybe she could learn from some of you who are already you know, into, into college. She's uh, in the process of selecting what college she's going to go to, so she could definitely hear some advice from, from many of you students here. You know, I'm really looking forward to participating in this panel and to hearing from our amazing group of panelists and also from many of you who I'm sure have some amazing, amazing ideas, uh, especially in this very important issue, diaspora-driven development, youth, investing across borders, or more simply put, youth making a difference in other people's lives. Uh, but before we get started, I want to introduce someone who uh, knows what it is to be successful. Uh, she's a commitment certificate presenter, uh, Olympic medalist from both Summer and Winter Olympics. Please welcome to the stage, Lauren Williams. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to this working session. <clears throat> Before we begin the formal programming, I'd like to bring to the stage some student representatives of two of the uh, CGIU commitments. These commitments selected from a large pool of students as exemplary approaches to addressing global challenges. At this time, would Mohammed Hanif come from Queens University? Um, his challenge, according to the International Finance Corporation, micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, or MSMEs, are responsible for employing 33% of workers in the developing world. In Bangladesh, the MSME market has a great potential to alleviate poverty and unemployment, but its growth is stunted by limited, very limited access to credit and the formal fin financial sector. The International Organization for Migration estimates that over 5 billion Bangladesh have left the country to find work abroad, and cumulatively they are sending nearly 13 billion U.S. dollars home annually to in, remittance, in remittances. Currently, there is a significant interest by members of the diaspora to facilitate investment in Bangladesh, but there is no platform to connect them with the MSME that are desperate for investment capital. So how Mohammed plans to address it. Today, Mohammed is committing to create an online platform specifically designed to connect 100 Bangladeshi diaspora investors living in the United States and Canada with over 500 entrepreneurs living in Bangladesh. By June of 2015, the online platform will allow investors to communicate with, mentor, and invest in Bangladeshi MSMEs. So they will have the capital, tools, and resources necessary to expand their businesses. With heavy supply of remittances already flooding the, into the country and strong potential for growth in MSME market, Bangladesh could soon witness a great deal of growth and thanks to this coordination of resources. So let's give Mohammed a hand. One of the things I thought was really cool is that he chose a place that, you know, is near and dear to his heart because um, he's from Bangladesh and he already knows that community, so he can grow that a lot easier. <laughs> Next we have Yasin Ahmed Ismail of Wakes Forest University. For the past 23 years, a civil war has been tormenting Somalia to the point where now, according to the United Nations Development Program, one million Somalis have left the country to escape violence. With at least one million Somalis living abroad, the country is dealing with a serious concern of brain drain due to the outflow of human capital. In addition, 67% of the Somali youth are unemployed. According to his own research, Yassin has found that the majority of the diaspora young people are well-educated, fluent in Somali language, and willing to learn, return to Somalia temporarily to improve the nation. 
but there's no platform in existence that can help them return and use their knowledge to develop a better Somalia. So how Yassin is addressing the situation? In response to Somalia's brain drain, Yassin is committing to start the Somali Diaspora Corps. He will recruit members of the Somali diaspora community and to temporarily return to and rebuild Somalia in four core areas, health, education, development, and democracy. Over the next two years, the Somali diaspora corps will recruit 100 volunteers, predominantly from the younger generation, to use their knowledge, skills, and expertise, to specifically in Mogadishu, Somalia. Professionals from business and development fields will help establish a microloan program and offer entrepreneurial guidance to women and young people so they can start their own small businesses. By 2016, this initiative will offer free mobile health clinics to Somalis who have been forced to flee from their home but remain within the country's borders. Teach English in schools, establish a microloan program, and help women and young entrepreneurs and instill the, young, the power of, and importance of one man, one vote concept in Somali youth. So let's give Yassin, Yassin a hand. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Oh, that's much better. Anyway, again, thank you to, to Lauren and congratulations to Mohammed and Yasid, I think, who exemplify what this is all about. You know, this is a very, very good time for education. Uh, enrollment in colleges and universities is at an all time high. And if I may add, numbers of enrollment is even higher among the ladies, among women. <laughs> Lady power, women power. Uh, there's no doubt that higher education is no longer a luxury. It's, it's definitely a necessity. But what's also true is more and more is that there's a need for engagement on the part of the youth. You know, people can no longer expect governments, organizations, foundations, um, nonprofits, churches only to solve the problems of the world. It takes people to solve the problems of other people and to help make a difference in the lives of other people. Uh, fortunately for all of us, your generation is one with a very strong social conscience. And nowhere is that more evident than here at uh, ASU. I think it was very enlightening for me to read about this university and the schools very, very strong commitment to student-driven social change and entrepreneurship. And one of the reasons why this school was chosen uh, for this particular event. Now, in this session, as you heard before, we will be discussing how diaspora communities that include 215 million people around the world come together to help their countries of origin. In 2012 alone, as you will see in, in your programs, remittances from diaspora communities totaled over $534 billion, and that is three times more the official development assistance provided uh, to developing countries. Now, young people contribute to economic development in low-income areas in significant ways that we're going to be, be hearing about from our panelists and hopefully from some of you also. So let's begin by introducing our, our panelists. And we'll begin with Manjula Desenayaki. I'm sure, I hope I am pronouncing your name correctly. He's the founding president of Educate Lanka Foundation, a nonprofit social enterprise that connects global micro-philanthropists, mainly within the diaspora, uh, with students in economically disadvantaged backgrounds to fund the cost of students' education. Thank you so much. <laughs> Welcome. Came from Washington, D.C. Yes. Next, uh, may I introduce Vanessa Cárdenas. She's the Vice President of Progress 2050 at American Progress. Her work focuses on the intersection of policy and race with particular attention to demographic changes, immigration, and issues relevant to the growing Latino community in the United States. Welcome, both of them from Washington. And thirdly, may we uh, bring to the stage Eric Vincent Guichard, correct? Yes. 
Yes, founder and chief executive officer of Home Strings. Um, very interesting, Home Strings is a contraction of homesick and heartstrings, and we'll hear about each one of them um, about their organizations. And if I may uh, begin with, with the lady, ladies first, is that okay? Vanessa? Sure. Uh, Vanessa, yes, explain yes. to us what Progress 250 is all about and why you got involved. You know, sure. one of the things that I want to just to think about and get a mental picture of this, each one of these people who are who represent organizations that are really making a difference where, where you are now. They were once students and something clicked and something happened in them that made them dedicate their entire lives to helping others. So let's hear a little bit about their story sure, and about their organizations. And thank you so much, Maria Elena. And I'm just really pleased to be here in this panel. I'm very honored to be here. But as Maria Elena says, I work um, at the Center for American Progress. If you guys don't know, CAP, it's a policy think tank in Washington, D.C. It was founded by John Podesta. He was the chief of staff for Bill Clinton, and now he's back at the White House working for President Obama. And CAP covers the range of issues from economic policy to immigration to education policy, national security, and so on. And I was actually, I grew up in the immigration movement. I came to the United States when I was 14 years old and um, to the Washington, D.C. suburbs. And as Maria Elena said, something clicked on me when I was about to graduate high school because um, I had come as an immigrant, but I was actually born in Brooklyn, New York. Anybody from New York here in the room? Yay! <laughs> I'm from Brooklyn, even though I don't have the accent. Um, but anyway, when I came from, I was born in Brooklyn. My mom was an immigrant in the 70s. Uh, but because of the immigration situation, she went, she went back home, and then we, I grew up in Bolivia, never questioning who I was or where I was from. And then when um, the economy tanked in Bolivia in the 80s, my mom said, we need to go back because if you want to have a future, I cannot stay here anymore. So we moved back to the United States, and by then my family have moved from New York City to the D.C. suburbs for better jobs and better opportunities. So that's how I came to Washington, D.C. And when I was in high school, I was in the ESL program, and when people asked me, where were you born? I I very, um, in, I was very, I guess, naive. I said I was born in Brooklyn, and they're like, no, no, really, where, where, where are you from? I'm like, I was born in Brooklyn, <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 where, where are you from in Latin America? And I was like, oh, I'm from Bolivia, and they're like, oh, okay, so you are undocumented, and they checked that box. But when I was about to graduate, I went to my counselor and I said, look, I wanna, I wanna go to school, I wanna go to college, and she's like, well, you can't because you don't have papers. I was like, what do you mean? I was born in the United States, so went through this whole process where they had to go check my papers, and they were like, oh. Oh, yes, you do. You can actually go to college. And I was able to go to college. But sort of like a bulb, uh, a light bulb went off for me because I felt so sad that out of probably the 30 students that came in with me in, in for my freshman year, I was probably one of five that actually were able to go to college. And that really devastated me because I felt that it was so unfair and it was just unjust in that sort of what really, I guess, um, I was already very active in high school, but that really sort of pushed me to become more active. And I became, and I, you know, through many volunteer experiences, I was able to land at a job at the National Immigration Forum, which is a policy, um, is a policy group focused on immigration policy. And then I was doing a lot of communications work, um, doing uh, outreach to Spanish language media. And I was probably one of the few, very few people at that time that was doing um, Spanish language outreach. And then I went to the Center for American progress because I felt that after the immigration debates in the 2007, 2008, we needed more Latino voices, not just in the immigrant rights movement, but sort of in the broader progressive movement, and I came to CAP. And now I lead Progress 2050, which looks um, at the changing demographics in our nation and how closing racial gaps is not just a moral imperative, but an economic imperative, given the fact that by 2043, the majority of people in this nation are going to be people of color. So anyway, very quick background on what I do. Oh, very, very interesting. Thank you, Vanessa. <laughs> Manjul, explain to us also how you got involved and how your foundation works. Sure. Sorry. Can you hear me? Is it There's a little button at the end that we're supposed to... There we go. Is it on? Okay. Yeah. There we go. Cool. Uh, thanks, thanks, Marina and uh, Maria. And uh, really, really honored to be here again. Uh, I was actually in your shoes a few years ago. Uh, as a student commitment maker and last year uh, as, a, uh, as a youth organization member. Uh, and it's really great to come back here and uh, speak and share my experience again. Uh, I am originally from Sri Lanka. I am an immigrant myself. Uh, I came to the United States, as many of you have probably, uh, to do my uh, higher studies, to go to college. I came to University of Maryland. I graduated uh, in finance just uh, 
just as a regular international student who wanted to come uh, to the United States for better opportunities, uh, get my education, and have uh, you know earn some earn, earn money. Uh, perhaps one day go back, or if not, settle down here. Uh, but uh, when I graduated in 2005, uh, in 2004, December, uh, something uh, special happened. Uh, something very unfortunate, uh, which was the South Asian tsunami. And uh, that moment, I still remember, I uh, woke up and I heard the news, I called my parents. Uh, luckily, they were fine, uh, since we lived in the mountains in the middle, not on the beach. Uh, but it just uh, threw me off, and I really needed to act. I, I had this uh, 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 this urgency to act and do something from here. So I got together with my roommates, and we created uh, a series of fundraisers and events to uh, do whatever we can to collect money and uh, help those victims and the survivors. And that experience, actually, uh, uh, that was that what we started. Uh, galvanized and ignited the youth in the Washington community, uh, the Sri Lankan diaspora community, and uh, really gave a meaningful experience. And that was the first time I realized how much uh, we could do from here uh, to those uh, who need help back home. Uh, we were just, uh, you know, we did that out of the uh, necessity. But uh, after that uh, series of events, I realized that uh, we could do more. Uh, there's so much impact that we can have back home by doing so little. Uh, I went into finance, uh, into investment banking. Uh, so while doing that, uh, we thought, uh, why not uh, create something that more people can participate? So that was the idea uh, the, for Educate Lanka. That's how uh, Educate Lanka started, to create a platform. Because we knew uh, with a very little bit of money, you can give an opportunity for someone to get an education that they deserve. I was privileged enough, and uh, many others were privileged enough to come here and get that education. And that opportunity to get a quality education made me who I am today. And we realized that only 10 to $25 a month, or even, even lower, can actually provide someone. Uh, and that would be the difference of someone going to college, or secondary or high school, or staying home. Uh, and we thought uh, it was not the first time. It was not a new idea. This has been done before, but we knew that we could do it in a different way. Because when you uh, are dealing with the diaspora, uh, the first thing that I, uh, I realized from my own lessons was you need to build credibility and trust. Um, so we knew uh, we created this platform to provide 100% uh, accountability, transparency, and a platform for all the diaspora to participate. Uh, so it was just not me and my friends, but people from around the world who wanted to contribute back, and we provided that platform for them to participate by identifying the students who are deserving of these scholarships and connecting them with these people uh, who wanted to contribute back and invest in their education. So they get the opportunities to empower themselves, uh, not just giving handouts, but actually giving those opportunities so they can realize their own aspirations and become leaders of the next generation. Very good, and thank you for sharing that. Eric has a similar situation where you were also born in New York, but you were raised in, in uh, your parents' country of Guinea. Uh, absolutely. You know, Brooklyn in the house. I, I was born in <laughs> Brooklyn as well, Flatbush <laughs> Avenue, um, uh, of an American, African-American mother and an African uh, father who met uh, as students in, uh, in France, my mother being a, uh, at the time a, a Fulbright student from the uh, University of Wisconsin. Uh, I actually grew up in Guinea, spent 20 years in Guinea, in, in rural Guinea, and doing a lot of the cultural revolutional, uh, revolutionary things that were happening at the time. Um, and so I got to know poverty firsthand, uh, people not being able to uh, you know, meet their daily needs, the government making promises but not being able to meet them for a number of geopolitical reasons. And uh, at the time, you, know, you don't really know what's going on. So, but when I came uh, to the US, I uh, was very fortunate, I got a, a great education and ultimately wind up at the, uh, at the World Bank in the finance complex, which is the heart of the, uh, of the bank who uh, manages you know, about $100 billion worth of bank liquidity. So I got to learn how to do investments. <clears throat> I ultimately left the bank um, six years in. I had the itch, uh, the entrepreneurial itch. And what was the, the burning desire was trying to find a way to connect uh, the expertise I had gained from, uh, you know, from academia 
and the expertise I had gained from the World Bank and, and Wall Street and try to find a way to put that to work in order to facilitate uh, economic development. And the first iteration of that was a company that I started in 96. Many of you weren't born. No, just kidding. <coughs> um, which, which basically uh, helped the ministries of finance better understand how to structure their financing. Because at the time, many of these countries were taking on a lot of debt without really understanding what the implications were on their social uh, policies. Um, after coming up with a, you know, what I thought was a great idea, the World Bank borrowed the idea and ultimately made it a, um, a, a success. The second iteration of this, uh, of, um, of this burning desire was noticing, you know, the same numbers that Maria mentioned, which is, you know, half a trillion dollars flowing from the West, <clears throat> essentially a country of immigrants, which is the U.S., to uh, frontier markets and emerging markets, primarily for social support. Now, half a trillion dollars is a lot of money. Just to put it in perspective, China's entire economy is nine trillion. The U.S.'s entire economy is 14 trillion. So, you know, to have half a trillion dollars flowing person to person is a lot of money. But what I also noticed, because I was one of the people sending money via Western Union, was that a portion of those funds is actually looking for investments. And that, this is very, very important. Aid is important, but investment is even more important because what investment does, it underpins sustainability, i.e. the ability of uh, a, a practice or a business or an activity to basically go on without necessarily having to have additional external aid. And so that was very important, but there was a missing part to that. Yes, it's one thing to... Uh, convince people who are receiving money that they need to invest in their own country, but you need to structure whatever the investments are in a very convincing way. It has to be transparent, it has to be credible, and what we found out, it has to be profitable because people want to put their savings into something that's not only transform transformative from a social economic standpoint, but also makes them you know, a, a reasonable return. And so using our World Bank experience, we went in, structured a number of these projects, whether it's real estate, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's power, whether it's transport, whether it's housing, which is a huge gap in Africa, and then turn them into small mutual funds that members of the diaspora can actually purchase online at a little, as little as $1,000, and at the same time uh, channel money into these projects, which are the pillar of economic, uh, economic recovery. Um, the success of that project was uh, quite significant. Uh, we ultimately called it Home Strings, as Mary mentioned, a, a contraction of home, sick, and, and heart strings. And we currently have about, uh, we've invested in 33 countries. We have about uh, close to $30 million invested. And we also have institutional investors who are now participating on this platform. In fact, on the institutional side, we are close to $250 million worth of uh, financing that we've received for various projects uh, on, the, uh, on the continent. We'll be rolling out into Asia later this uh, summer and then ultimately into Latin America um, first quarter of 2015. Very interesting. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, let's go back to Vanessa. But Vanessa, we know that there's uh, countries in Latin America, the ones that are closest to home, that depend so much on the um, remittances that are sent from, from their families in the U.S. What successes have you seen among these immigrant communities in as, as far as promoting development in their countries of origin. Sure, and since I'm the political science major here, very different from the economic, I think we, you know, we have to think about it uh, in different ways. There's definitely a lot of economic development and economic opportunities that, that come out of diaspora communities, and that's hugely important. But we also should, should think about the politi political empowerment that also can happen in communities, both here in the United States and abroad. And that's what I would like to speak um, to a bit. And I want to um, bring to your attention a, a person, I don't know if you heard of her, Elvira Arellano, who is an immigrant. She was um, detained, I think, in 2000. She was actually Times Person of the Year in 2006. She, um, she was an immigrant who was uh, arrested in a raid. She used to work at the airport of Chicago. And then she had a deportation order. She, um, she sought sanctuary in Chicago in a church for a whole year, uh, arguing that she wanted to stay because she had a US-born son. 
And then she went from the being this really humble and really quiet um, victim of the immigration system to becoming a powerful and really strong voice for the whole immigrant community. And after her whole struggle that whole year in that ch church uh, looking for sanctuary, she was eventually deported. But I, wa I wanna bring her to your attention because she took all the activism that she did here in the United States on behalf of immigrant communities and she took it back home. So that for the last uh, seven years that she has been in Mexico, she uh, has actually been organizing immigrant communities in Mexico, immigrants that come through from El Salvador or Guatemala that are trying to come to the United States. And she also has been working to change policies in Mexico so they b uh, treat better their immigrants over there. So completely consistent with the work that she has done. And she has really been, I think, an agent of change. And just two days ago, again, she went back to the border to request asylum, and now she's back in the United States and her case is being reviewed. So I think that the whole point that I want to make to you is that economic development is hugely important for our communities. In fact, Mexico receives about $9.3 billion in remittances, and there are many programs, for example, that the Mexican government um, supports this, those remittances. They have a very popular program called Dos Por Uno, Tres Por Uno, that for every dollar an immigrant sends here from the United States to, to Mexico, the government matches it. So, and to fund really like schools and hospitals. So there's really innovative and interesting ways that um, both communities here are looking at their governments back home to really match the monies that they're sending and, and also pushing the government to actually act and provide resources and infrastructure to those communities. But I also don't want you to lose um, to lose sight of the fact that your organizing, your work here in the United States is being watched by your communities back home. And they really draw inspiration from you. And I could just go on and on. I mean, when Marielena was talking about the fact that um, women of color, especially in the United States, are making a lot of advances. If you look at the immigrant rights movement, there are a lot of women in, po in power. Gabby Pacheco, who's an immigrant, and I don't know if you heard about her, she walked from Florida all the way to Washington, D.C. with her colleagues, 1,500 miles to call attention to the plight of the dreamers, and now she's she got DACA, which is the Defer Action Program that President Obama passed, and now she's running a nonprofit giving a scholarships to young people. So, uh, you know, I want you to know that what you do is, um, you know, it's giving inspiration to folks, and I think that's hugely important. The economic piece is hugely important as well, but the political empowerment and the inspiration that you're giving through your project is really important as Thank well. Thank you for pointing that out. It's very, very, very important. Thank you. Yeah, and I'd like to recognize the fact that Dreamers, and I'm sure many of you know who the, what Dreamers is, stands for, uh, are really the ones that are making a big impact in Washington as far as the immigration movement is concerned. You know, I, I would credit the Dreamers for reaching whatever we've been able to uh, to reach in, as far as immigration because of their activism, because of, of their valor, and they're admirable young people. Uh, Manjula, uh, talk to us a little bit about what, what philanthropists actually do um, to help not only home in their home countries, but also to their own communities here, to young students who you know, need education, need support of education. Sure. Um, so philanthropists, uh, we call our philanthropists uh, micro-philanthropists, because uh, what we are providing are mi micro-scholarships, uh, similar to Kiva, who came up with the micro sort of finance concept, online finance concept. Um, we provide these micro-scholarships that Give, enable them to have that access to education, mentoring, and guidance. So uh, what the, the platform uh, that Educate Lanka created allows anyone from around the world who have access to internet to s s identify these already pre-screened uh, students and commit to fund their education throughout the completion of their higher studies. And in return, they get extensive monitoring and comprehensive feedback from the students and engage in a uh, more uh, personalized relationship with the student. But uh, over time, what we realized is that um, scholarships are not enough. Uh, we, uh, one thing that we learned over the years is to listen to our beneficiaries and listen to our students. Because uh, a lot of times uh, I've seen organizations doing things that they think are, is right. But uh, you have to also be careful that by uh, the good intentions doesn't necessarily mean into good impact. Sometimes you could do more harm than doing better, good. In what way? Uh, in different ways. I mean, uh, sometimes you think that you know the community. Sometimes you could be given something that you think is actually making a difference, but it might not at the community level. So we spend a lot of time listening to our communities and understanding directly from our students what their necessities are. The first 
point of intervention is of course access. That's where the funding comes in and the scholarship give, gives them that access. But over time, they, we already also realize that they need guidance, they need mentorship, and they need connections to employment because they haven't had the same opportunities that everyone else had uh, because of their economic disadvantage, you know, because their economic destitution. So over time, we built in this community participation approach where we provide the mentorship and the guidance and eventually the connections to employment. So not only do they get the access to education and realize uh, their uh, higher education, but also they get the proper guidance and connections. So the, the philanthropists are able to enable those that access and more so they can also participate as volunteers. So we have over 100 volunteers in the Washington community area uh, diaspora community, from the diaspora community. And we have uh, other volunteers from over 20 countries who are involved because it's an online platform that they can contribute from their own community and uh, be part of Educate Lanka. Right. Uh, Eric, I want to come to you because what you do at Homestrings is a huge undertaking. What are some of the obstacles that you face in, in, in building these financial connections across the borders? I think um, one of the biggest challenges, well, first of all, my, my personal limitations, and then there are the challenges that are inherent in the undertaking itself. So, you know, I'm old school, so I, you know, I came to the internet in a, in a very long-winded way, and so I had to hire a lot of people who had the expertise to basically bring this vision to, uh, uh, to fruition. But aside from that, one of the biggest challenges that we've encountered, uh, you know, there's a lot of money being thrown to developing countries to help regulatory uh, impediments, i.e., you know, uh, uh, laws and, and rules that uh, impede people to, from starting businesses and doing businesses. One of the biggest impediments that we have found, uh, you know, uh, contrary to public opinion, is the regulatory c constraints that we have in the U.S. Uh, many of the projects that we have listed on homestrings.com are projects that are deemed to be private projects, i.e. they're not listed on a stock exchange. So therefore, only people who meet a certain income level under the U.S. Security and Exchange Commission can actually have access to those private investments. So if you had $500, for example, and you wanted to invest in a toll road in the Congo that would facilitate... Uh, you know, uh, produce from the hinterlands into the city, you couldn't simply because, one, unless you're a millionaire and you have a trust fund, you couldn't because the SEC would prevent us from letting you have access to investing into that bridge. So the biggest impediment that we have found has been the U.S.'s own rules and regulations preventing a nation of immigrants from participating in the financing of investments in their home country. Um, and aside from that, uh, the other one which we have recently resolved, in fact, using uh, university students uh, is what's called due diligence, i.e. the ability to go on the ground, look at a project and say, yes, the documents that, re that are describing this project match what's on the ground. And what we've done is that we've tapped into university students in the various countries. And we have um, MOUs, uh, Memoranda of Understanding, that basically allow them to volunteer on behalf of home strings and contribute through the social media on the due diligence aspect of what's going on. So they take their cameras, they film the bridge being, being built, or they talk to the, uh, to the project manager, or they go and talk to the minister of, of transport, and then they upload that information, which forms part of the due diligence that most people, most diaspora members rely on when they're making a decision to invest in a project. I know we've been talking a lot about what people can do to donate, and we're talking about big corporations, so those who are able to, to give of their pockets um, to help uh, their communities back home. But what can people, like the ones in this room, what can students do? What are the different roles that they can play? And any of you that want to answer that can go ahead and take it. I guess I'll go first. I think the first thing is you have to own your leadership. I don't care whether you want to start a small business that's you know, looking at doing microloans or whether you want to be part of a big movement. I think um, for, especially for immigrant communities, I think the undocumented population here has really given an example of what happens, you know, the power that you can exert. It's true we don't have an immigration reform bill yet, but I think it's, it's 
everybody that you would, anyone that you would ask will tell you it's a matter of when, not of if, um, and how good it's an immigration reform will be eventually. So I would say, first of all, own your leadership, um, be front and center, have a communication strategy, whether you want to pitch a small business idea or a big thing, um, you know, a, a big thing, organizing idea, you have to have a good communication strategy, you have to know what, what your pitch is going to be. And most importantly, think about the human story. Again, going back to the dreamers, I think the reason they have been so successful about putting immigration back on the table is because they have been telling about their own story, how these uh, policies affect their lives, their families, their communities, their, their kids. So I think um, doing that is really, really important. Anybody else want to add to that before we open uh, it yeah, up? Yeah, uh, just, just quickly. I mean, um, one thing that I realized when I was graduating from college, uh, you know, being having lived in Africa, is how powerful you are as students, and more importantly, how, how much you don't know how pow powerful you are. And I think um, taking ownership of that power and using it in the world of, of the internet is, a, is, is an amazing thing. Every single one of you can create a massive ripple effect on the internet using, so, using uh, so, social media. And so finding the right cause, and the cause that is right is one that's closest to your heart. Finding the right cause, taking it um, to uh, a community, building a community, and making sure that, that, uh, <clears throat> that your beliefs are, are projected into that, that project, I think is, is the, one of the most gratifying thing. Uh, you know, you'll find out later on that if you follow your, your instincts, if you follow your heart, the money will come later. You know, things about you know, uh, financing you know, a, a way of life, that will come much later. Follow your, your passion and use this power, this knowledge that you have gained in, you know, at the university. Use that to change the world because in, in the age of the internet, you have all the power. And it comes back to you, doesn't it? A absolutely. <laughs> you give it out there and it comes back to you. Before you go into your own groups to discuss the different projects that you, that, that you want to discuss and to answer the question of the day, we're going to open it up for a question. So whoever wants to ask a question, please raise your hand, introduce yourself, tell us where you're from. Go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Gerald Kears. Um, I think this was particularly interesting to me because I am from Puerto Rico, which actually has a large community of people leaving the island to go to the U.S. mainland, and also because I'm here p representing a youth member organization called Generation Enterprise, and we invest training and resources in street youth in Lagos, Nigeria, and Delhi in India. And specifically, one of the, our, our main targets during 2014 is reaching out to expats in Nigeria that actually want to invest back in their country. But my question specifically goes to Eric, but is open to the rest. How do we convince, or how do we portray the message to expats to say, we want your discretionary income to invest in street youth, as opposed to why not sending that money straight to your family? Why would someone, instead of investing in their families, invest in an organization like Generation Enterprise? Um, th that's, that's an excellent question because one of the things that we, we um, learned uh, to our benefit is that uh, expats who in, in this case live outside of their home country, so live in the US, in the UK, elsewhere, they have two different decision making processes that are in play. The first one is a philanthropic decision making process. Using that process, they will give closest to, uh, you know, closest to their social network, you know, whether it's uh, in the village, in the community, in their ethnic group, et cetera. When it comes to investing, where the impact is twofold, one, there's a, a socioeconomic impact of the investment related to the project, but there's also an income generation element or wealth building element, that decision-making process becomes Pan-African. So we have on our platform, Nigerians who are investing in Kenya, Kenya investing in South Africa, et cetera. So that, that's, that's to our credit. Now, specific to your to your question, I think it's important, and this goes to marketing, marketing as a science, it's important for you to understand what are the, uh, um, the discretions that these individuals have when they, um, when they use their discretionary income. So part of the, the discretionary income is to send money back home to support family, part of it is for investments, but potentially it's finding the argument that will convince them to contribute to this program by showing the impact that the program is having. So if you can show uh, how many people are being trained, uh, how many of them are going to college, or how many of them are finding jobs, or how many of them have stabilized their families, or how many of them are convincing other kids to move away from streets 
to you know more formal uh, lives. That becomes a very, very strong and persuasive argument to basically get them to separate from their discretionary income into your, your program. Keep in mind that you are competing with several other uh, opportunities out there within the same realm, and potentially including home strings, right? Yeah, let to, uh, just to add on, Eric, um, the good uh, point about the impact. Uh, I would say your impact and stories drive your market. You'll be able to find a lot more people joining you as, so, as long as you have proper accountability, transparency, and results to show. Uh, i give you some examples on uh, philanthropic investments through our platform. You know, Sri Lanka went through an ethnic conflict for 30 years, and we just came out of a war after 30 long years. And now we have seen uh, actual the, et the et two ethnicities, the Tamils and the Sinhalese, uh, using our platform to fund students from the other community. And it's really a strong indication of what such a platform can do. Because all you needed to do was to create the platform, and everyone will use it and follow it to make a difference. And that was the last thing that I thought our platform would do. Congratulations. Next question, over here. My name is Keju, and I'm originally from Kenya. My commitment is to empower, to give voice to the Maasai women who are currently, who are currently affected by the female genital mutilation. This is uh, something that has happened literally from when I can remember. There's been a lot of uh, campaign about it, but it's not ending. So my, my dream is to see that FGM has gone to the books of anthropology. So my question to you, Mr. Eric, you, I know you've worked with so many different, um, you've worked with so many different countries, specifically Kenya. One of the big things that is affecting my country, and that's the reason why I personally believe that the FGM has not uh, ended in Kenya, because we have a law that has not been, um, is not being put to work to stop the FGM. There's a lot of money that has been pumped out there, pumped out to the government of Kenya by the United Nations and donors. How do you beat out the corruption of that money so that the money can get into the people that desperately need it, like the Maasai people who have been marginalized all these years. Wow. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Wow. Uh, how much time question. do I have? <laughs> um, FGM is a is a tragedy uh, in Kenya, in Guinea, where I was from. I have, you know, friends of mine who uh, were Muslim, uh, who I went to high school with, who had gone through. Um, that kind of experience, and it. Ah, uh, okay. So, I I understand uh, emotionally what it what it's like. From a policy standpoint, um, I think um, you you have to take into account where the pressure points are, right? And the pressure points are related to funding, as you mentioned it. And I think you need to influence policymakers in the US, policymakers in the UK and the Commonwealth who are providing needed financing to Kenya to take this into account and, and filter their aid uh, on the basis of results from politicians having them do the same thing, do, do uh, quantifying what they've been able to achieve, uh, documenting what they've been able to achieve, and then, and then uh, speaking to the uh, Maasai community to find out whether change has actually been um, you know, been uh, been implemented. Bringing them here to t testify in Congress, bringing them to the UK to testify in in in, uh, in Parliament. I think, you know, that is one of the most powerful processes that you can engage in that could affect uh, change. And then there's what do you do back home, right? What do what does the Messiah community do back home in conjunction with these, you know, with these external pressures to uh, to affect change? And that, that I, I, I can, you know I don't need to tell you what to do, you know, um, in that realm. Thank you very much. Another question? Over here in front. Hello, my name, my name is Randy Diaz, and I come from Miami. We are helping undocumented students get financial aid, legal assistance. Um, but my question is, how do you um, increase, specifically you guys, if you could give an example, your ethos, your, your um, credibility, in um, marketing your scheme, your not scheme, um, your program, and uh, it could be really, a scheme. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you guys do specifically to to 
you know, because a lot of people are passionate and like it's all, it all makes sense. But how do you increase as a college student your credibility specifically? Vanessa, I don't know if you want to address that one. You mean to, to marketing to for your program so people know more yeah. about the fact that you're funding undocumented for students? the funding and specifically also um, in the political influence as well. Sure. I know my mayor and good friends with him, but um, also it's, it's difficult, you know. Yeah, it's a lot of resistance, especially when it comes to undocumented students. Yeah, and I think it goes what, both ways. I think you, you have to do two things. As I um, said earlier, I think the human face, the human factor, the the human toll is really important in this debate. I think it takes it from a conversation about policies and about number of visas, about legality and illegality, to really bring it home, right? To sort of how um, the fact that, for example, somebody who's really successful and has finished college is trying to go into uh, getting a, pursue a master's degree, how that person is not, is not able to because of costs. So I think that's one. But I think the other piece is also the economic argument, right? And we, and we need to really bring that to the attention of uh, elected leaders as well as business leaders. Because if anyone is serious about economic empowerment here in the United States for their communities, they have to think about the long-term effects of keeping thousands of young people from achieving their economic dreams and what that will mean to our future economy. So to the extent, I mean, there's a lot of analysis of, on, for example, um, how many business immigrants start, um, how, how much money they give in local taxes and federal taxes. So there's a lot of really strong economic arguments that you could use, and, and you can go to AmericanProgress.org or, for example, the Migration Policy Institute. They have lots of uh, resources on that realm. But I think pairing your human, fa human face message with your economic facts is really important. And really also uh, building alliances. It's one thing for me as the sort of the brown Latina to go and argue for immigration reform. It's something else when you have, for example, the president of the Chamber of Commerce to say, look, you know, we need, to, we need these workers and we need them to be educated. So you really have to make interesting alliances like that. We have time, I think, for one more question before we go into, into the groups over here. Hi, I'm Christine. I'm coming in from Dubai. And um, as some, uh, thank you so much for sharing your stories because as someone who was born in New York but was raised in Haiti, I grew up around strong women who use, turn to street vending to um, basically alleviate themselves out of poverty. And so for me, as someone who was educated in the U.S. and going back now to Haiti to really launch a platform for street vendors, not only in Haiti but globally, one um, issue that I face and a lot of my friends from Jamaica, Kenya, Nigeria, who are trying to go back within their respective communities is connecting back with their country of origin. Because once you live in the experience of opportunity, like in America or UK or what have you, when you go back into these communities, they kind of say, like, you don't understand our struggle anymore because you lived outside of our, our struggle. So what advice do you have for any of us who are trying to go back and connect back and do positive change to strategically get back to that platform and make them understand that we are trying to come back even though we had a different experience outside of our country of origin? Thank well, you. Well, both Manjula and Eric can, can, can respond to that because and you, you both had that experience. Sure. Um, for, for us, it's, it's about, uh, again, uh, making connection back to the community because that's what we realized uh, when we started the platform by living in the US, living in other developed countries, we can send money, but if you don't have that community participation and engagement, uh, you are not building credibility for yourself there. And also you may make a mistake of not identifying the problem that you're trying to solve. So it is really, really important that you, uh, you engage with the community level and listen to them and participate them into your programs. So because once you develop that collaboration, it not only uh, allows you to understand the issue better, but it also strengthens and you, you, you are making a different difference at the community level and that is what is important. Um, that's a very um, challenging question in the sense that there's an interpersonal challenge um, and then there's, you know, there's the challenge of being the first, right? So the first wave of diasporas who go back tend to have very, very difficult uh, experiences. Um, there's the tragic example of Ob uh, President Obama's father going back to Kenya as a Harvard PhD. Um, I think that what is important uh, as on, a, on the interpersonal side is not to go back with the thought that you are the savior because that, that's picked up on, and when it's picked up on, you will only find 
blockade and frustration. I think it's important for you to go back with the understanding that you have a role to play. And that role may, if you one of the first waves, uh, that role may be to be the spokesperson for the community, where your skills are to know what to say and how to say it to the external community. Right, so most of the first wave successful diaspora who have returned have, turned, have become ambassadors or been part of the diplomatic corps in various key cities, speaking on behalf of their country in the language that's understood by the diplomatic corps. So very successful ambassador to Senegal and to uh, Cap Verde, small country like Haiti, uh, that essentially transformed Cap Verde. The second way, which is the sort of reverse brain drain that we're seeing, Nigeria being the case where the Minister of Finance is a former World Bank Managing Director, Central Bank Governor, etc., that group is much more um, um, active because they already have the credibility. They're not the first wave, they're the second wave. People understand the value of the returning diaspora and put them to work very, very quickly on domestic policy. So Nigeria is now the largest economy. Uh, simply because of the fact that they've, they've had the diaspora come back and take over all the key functions. A decade or two decades before, Chile did the same thing, where you had what was called the uh, Chicago Boys come back under Pinochet, convinced them to liberalize the economy. After he was gone, they took over, and Chile is now one of the, one of the uh, strongest uh, um, middle-income countries in, in Latin America. So I think from an interpersonal standpoint, you go in, not with the idea of being a savior, but of, of, of trying to find your place, of trying to help in the best way you can given your skill set. And as things evolve, you can then use your skills in a much more dynamic way, in, 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 you know, in the case of Nigeria being one of them. Can I just say something really yeah, quickly quick. to that, very quickly? I think it's, this is a hugely important question. Yeah. I think when you are in the United States, you know, because everybody tells you this is awesome that you have achieved this much and you, know, you, have gone, you, know, you worked so hard and you made it, we buy into the notion that we did it just by our hard work and we don't realize that the reason we made it is because there was an infrastructure that supported us to achieve that. And then we go back home, we're like, if you guys just work really hard and if you guys just follow your dreams without realizing that the infrastructure that they're operating in is completely different. So I think that's really, really, um, you know, we have to meet them where they where they are, but we have to realize that we are not they're, we're not living half of what they're living, and we have to be really patient and just you know really realize that. Thank you, so Vanessa. There. Excellent answers. Thank you to all of you. We're gonna. It's time for you to get to work. <laughs> so if you can go into your own groups and amongst yourselves try to answer this question, given what you've heard today, working within or for the community that you care about the most. How will you ensure that the project you're working on will have an impact both in the short term and in the long term? And how will you measure that impact? So we'll give you about 10 minutes more or less so that we have time to hear from all of you to, to discuss this, 10 to 15 minutes. And then we want to hear from a few of you what the conclusions are, what, um, you know, what the solutions, what the plan of action is. So go ahead and start working. And thank you, panelists. That was amazing. Here. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Good, good. Uh, my name is Danielle Lane. This is my partner, Katra Bowers. And our group is called Women's Rock. And uh, what we do is uh, we want to, we're LGBTQ advocates. And uh, we want to discuss intimate partner violence within those relationships. Because a lot of people don't know about that. And uh, our short term goal is to uh, draw awareness to the community as far as involving our university. Uh, we go, we're, we're from Dallas, by the way, Texas, UNT. <laughs> Straight up, <laughs> straight up, yeah. So yeah, well, our short-term goal is to uh, involve the university and get them aware and uh, have them spread the word. We're hosting a social when we get back next week. And then once we do that, we want to get involved in the community and kind of have it like a 21 and up and under. And uh, we want to get involved in uh, Battleground Texas. And what that is, is a political organization that wants to make Texas a, a democratic state for the electoral votes. But our long-term goal is we want to uh, build a state-funded facility that is that has all LGBTQ counselors, because now they offer minors in that, or we want to have someone that's a part of the community that's uh, been a victim of that, so they can, you know, kind of uh, empathize with the, with the victims and, you know, kind of get over that. And we want to go uh, internationally and give a voice to the LGBT victims who don't have a voice. And uh, so that's, that's what our, our Like in Uganda, is. for example? Yes, <laughs> Uganda, Kenya, all of that, because it's just really bad out there. And uh, we're gonna, yeah, it is. So, but to measure our success, though, to measure our success is um, 
we want to we want to make an all inclusive environment where people are not afraid to be who they are, and uh, I think that's a, that's a, that goes around. That's the problem right now because a lot of people, uh, LGBTQ members, they have a problem with being outed or you know something like that, and a lot of people, uh, especially men, uh, they get in these relationships, and then about 20, 30 years later, the women find out that you know they were you know on the down low and things like that. So. We just want to create an environment where people are able to come out and all inclusive and, you know, like I said, long term, long term, go overseas and uh, kind of help or internationally and help everybody out. So that's our goal. And we're women's rock, by the way. So yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. Anyone else want to share their experience? So what conclusions you came up with? How could you can make an impact and make it long term? And how do you measure it? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Chimtai Langat. I'm from Kenya. And my project is called Peer to Peer for Peace. I'm trying to connect uh, Samburu girls who are also victims of FGM and early marriages um, to host family programs all over the country so that the girls get can get how it feels to have a mother who wakes up in the morning and goes to work, and how it feels to have a father who values educating a girl, so that in the future, when they also have families, they know how, how, we, how to run their families, and how um, FGM is not something that is good for them. And my long-term goal is to have an impact on the men, and have the men testify that they can marry a woman who is not who has not gone through the FGM because the problem right now is that the f the girls are getting pressure that they will not be married because of FGM so currently I'm trying to work with the girls try to give them a feel of how it feels to have a family um yeah so I'm working with Samburu Girls Foundation which is um a non-profit in Kenya and what I'm trying to do is also try to recruit girls who are educated from the Samburu community that did not go or went through FGM and are educated so trying to recruit them um, gives me credibility f in the community itself so that is something that I'm trying to consider because I'm not from the Samburu community but I am a girl who is privileged from Kenya to come and study here in the States and I feel it is something that every girl should have like an opportunity to have education and to have a family in the future without necessarily feeling that they are insecure because they have not gone through FGM yet. So that's Thank it. you so much. Congratulations. Like to share your experience here on this table? Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Sanafik with the click at the end. I'm from uh, Hadith, the capital of Ethiopia. And my commitment is to organize a skills training workshop to empower street beggars uh, in Hadith because there's a very strong population of street beggars. And you can't really go walk a good five minutes without being uh, um, approached by one. And we were talking about how to make how to make sure that our commitments are, are success successful in the long term. And I feel like... Uh, there should be more emphasis on empowerment than providing resources because the thing about resources is that they run out. And because we've been blessed enough, because we've been lucky and fortunate enough to have had these opportunities, I feel like it is our responsibility to provide these opportunities for the people who haven't had them, but that's the only role that we play. We should play. They are the masters of their own destiny. They can be motivated enough to provide the resources for themselves. So I feel like if we focus more on empowerment and providing opportunities and not necessarily resources, we can make sure that they're motivated enough to do those things for themselves. And I feel like that's the most important thing. And that will ensure that our commitments are sustainable in the long run because they are going to be motivated enough to provide changes for themselves and for their families. Excellent. Thank you so much. <laughs> this table here. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm Aaron Marshall. I'm from Western Carolina University uh, in Asheville, North Carolina. My, uh, my commitment is called SAPR, uh, Southern Appalachian Poverty and Place Effect Research. Uh, but I worked with our entire group here. And uh, I think the biggest thing that we noticed uh, for everyone is you need to create a, a culture of this community engagement. You need to go ahead and create a culture around this. Uh, and in doing so, that's how you can go ahead and measure these long, sustainable uh, changes that occur, as well as short-term changes that occur. In doing that, in uh, 
engaging, enabling, and inspiring others to kind of heed the call of service, to go and heed the call to interact with their community. That's the largest thing that you can go ahead and do. Uh, interacting with that human element, interacting with those individuals that you see on the ground every single day, and doing that, that's how you go ahead and see real sustainable change occur, whether it's short-term or long-term. You go ahead and see that, and that will go ahead and provide dividends further on down the line. Absolutely, economics is a huge part of it, uh, but also it's that human element. It's those individuals that you see day in and day out. So. Excellent, and I think that fits in with whatever it is that your issue is or your passion is or your program is. Back there. Hello, guys. My name is Afanyo Benali. I'm from, I was born and raised in Nigeria, Delta State. And, woo! I was born and raised in the Niger Delta, Niger Delta region of Nigeria, and if you know, the Niger Delta region is responsible for 85% of Nigeria's economy because that's where we have the crude oil. But unfortunately, over the years, what we have seen in the Niger Delta is an increase in crime, an increase in oil sabotage, and more engagement of young people in social vices. And this is as a result of the fact that young people have not been given the opportunity that they should be given as members of a community or a region that gives the nation so well. So my social change project is really called the Lead Nigeria Fellowship Program. And it's a fellowship program because what we're trying to do is empower young people with the opportunity to learn a vocation and also be able to get some microcredit funding support after learning that, after acquiring the vocation, vocation skill that they, they set out for. They get funding for it, build a business plan, and start up their own business. Now, in the short term, our goal is to ensure that within six months of the project, we're going to do a survey that helps us basically understand how these young people have accepted and appreciated this program we're giving them, and also how much the external environment reacts to it. And in the long run, we're going to ensure that we have individuals who are going to be our personal um, example and our personal models, and we're going to use these individuals in speaking to the community in trying to build support for the project and in trying to get more young people to be part of the vocational skill project. So at the end of the day, they're not just going to continue being nuisance in the streets, but be able to better build themselves by just being part of a six-month project or a seven-month project that at the end of the day makes them business owners. Thank you so much, and we have run out of time. This has been an incredible experience. I, I hope that all of you have learned from our amazing group of panelists. And I want, I want to thank, uh, of course, uh, Mandula and, and Eric and, and Vanessa. And I'm sure that all of us here on this stage have also learned from you. And I think that you've inspired all of us with your enthusiasm and with your energy, with your talent, with your knowledge. And like they say in Spanish, váyanse a comer el mundo. And if you need a translation, ask the person next to you to speak Spanish. Uh, best of luck to all of you and enjoy the conference. Thank you.